Hello and welcome to Everybody Podcast. I'm Daria Matza and I am so glad you're here. Today I bring to you a conversation with Shiloh George. Shiloh identifies as native, queer, and fat, and she has many stories to share with us today. She also has some wonderful advice at the end of our talk about how to approach doctors. So make sure to stick around for that. Let's get started. I mean, do you want to start with talking about kind of how you grew up in your childhood? and Like a lot of people, typical kind of family where your parents divorce and then your parents remarry. And my, you know, background is that my biological father is Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho. But, you know, because of colonization and things that have happened over generations, they don't really know a lot about what that means. And so... Uh, my mom's family is uh, Irish and Scottish, kind of typical white American family. And that's mostly the family that I grew up in. And we lived out in the woods in Oregon. And there were some really amazing parts about my childhood. And I love that I had access to woods and camping and hiking and all of that outdoor experience. And there was also, um, you know, some bad experiences of, you know, abuse and um you know, going from family to family and families have different cultures in them, uh, different spiritual traditions. So it was a little confusing on some of that. And I would say that because of abuse I faced as a child, um, sexual abuse and some other kind of psychological abuse that I learned from a young age that my body wasn't mine. Um, and it belonged to other people and that it wasn't a good place. Um, and really kind of the feeling of being kicked out of my body and being disassociated from it for, I'm 42 now, so for most of my life being disassociated from my body. And that was a really hard experience, a difficult experience. The thing I really heard in there was so connected to uh, indigenous people Mm -hmm. like that. And I often so think about how our, our family trauma is carried with us if we don't find some healing or resolution in there but just the language you used of my body is not my own you know like being occupied by others it it was so connected to that I don't know is that something you associate with and before I continue to I I would love clarification on this Mm -hmm. because I feel like a little embarrassed about the the preferred name to use indigenous people I I noticed even on I think it was the organization you work for they still used Indian or no yeah. Um, so here's kind of a brief. Give me the brief, and then we'll go back to your nomen- story. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the brief 101 on nomenclature of Native people. This is kind of my way of understanding it. Is you have words like Native American, and I think that is kind of a. If you want a term to use, that's probably kind of quote the safe word term to use for people. Um, American Indian slash Alaska Native is a legal term and is a term that you will see in legal documents in academic papers often, unless they're using the term indigenous. Um, And that's a very specific political legal term. And um, Indian would be more of an older generation. You can see people's generation and how they identify themselves as Native people or how they uh, a non-Native person would identify, oh, that's an Indian, is probably somebody who's going to be maybe from the generation, like the, you know, baby boomers, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the terms evolve over generations. Um, let's see, the other thing that I would say, Indigenous is a term that more people are using nowadays. And... I think that it's also an academic scholarly term that is kind of more progressive. If you are around Native people, you can always ask them how they like to be identified. As I really interchange Native American and Native um, and Indian, like sometimes it's Indian, like the whole word spelled out. And sometimes it's N-D-N. It's kind of like a slang term. Mm -hmm. And that would be an inner group in group term. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think uh, as native, I was like, I've never heard that. Now yeah. I know why. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a texting and then, okay. Uh, it's a little bit of a slang term. There's lots of other types of slang we use too. Wonderful. Sorry. I know that was, <laughs> no, I, I was thinking about it and I felt a little self-conscious about it. So I'm... no worries. I think it's always good to ask. Yeah. But I would love for you to 
go back to that idea of Mm -hmm. kind of your, your body carrying your history. Do you have that feeling? Absolutely. And I went, as I'm going through this healing process now, it's, you know, you go through and you think about your life and you think about what happened to you. And I have a very strong indigenous perspective and lens. And so I often think about my body as something that's been occupied. Um, So for an example, I think about the words that go through my head sometimes about how I feel about my body. And, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, negative things like, you know, you're not worthy or you shouldn't be wearing that shirt because it shows your fat rolls or, you know, it could be any number of negative thoughts. And I think who is that really me? Is that really what I think about myself? Or is that something that's kind of been implanted in my brain? Is it something that somebody said to me earlier on in my life and now has become my voice? And I think of those things as invasive species. Mm. You know, I think in terms of like, we think of invasive, mm -hmm, Mm -hmm. the invasive plant, um, you know, in our environments and things like that. And I think of those as like invasive species. And I've I feel like a lot of the work that I do is ripping out those thoughts over and over because they just kind of stay there mm-hmm. because we're in the same culture. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. yeah you're like constantly weeding. Exactly. And it's really kind of exhausting. <laughs> yeah, but that imagery is actually helpful. Yes. It's helpful for mm-hmm. everybody, I think, mm-hmm. even if you're, yeah, whatever you, wherever you, the story you come from. Yeah. And I think a lot of my healing process has been where do I have control? Where do I have autonomy? Where can I take action for myself Mm -hmm. and have that advocacy for myself? Mm -hmm. Action, I, you know, thinking is important and processing is important. And where is that action? So I think being that gardener and weeding is, even though it's a mental process, is an action and a a sense of caring for yourself and healing. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So back to your childhood story, do you have some stories from that time that feel like real markers of your history of your body or your life? Hmm. You know, I loved being outside and, you know, being around animals. We lived um, in, like I said, out in the woods and there was cattle around and horses and ponies. We had chickens and rabbits. Um, and I was, I loved every single animal that we had. And so I loved that relationship. And I really believe that those animals gave me a sense of healing and camaraderie and, and friend friendship when there was a lot of mm, drama happening around me with the adults around me and ex-wives and step parents and all of that kind of toxic stuff that was happening. I think the the peop, the adults in my life were trying the best that they could, but, you know, adults screw up all the time. Uh, and so those animals kind of became um, really good friends for me. Uh, I loved running around in the woods. And um, I think that that was a way to come back to myself that felt really good that then later was able to kind of come back to. What I noticed a lot was a, when I think back, is a surveillance about my body. And I was growing up in the 1980s and there was a new wave of weight loss culture that came through in the 1980s. So all the women in my life were on diets or were talking about them. And there was also, when I give presentations, I show pictures of myself as a child and growing up because I want them to see what my body actually looked like because I thought I was fat my whole entire life. And that's what I was being told. I was also being told, well, you're not quite fat yet. Or they weren't using the term fat. They were using the term overweight. But you're not quite there yet. But we want to do things so that you don't become fat later as an adult. Were most of the people in your family fat? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Especially the women. Okay. Mm -hmm. Were, you know, chubby to... So they were projecting. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. You know, they were probably hearing those messages, you know, from the media. They were probably hearing those messages from their doctors. And if you love your children, you don't want them to have to face the same thing you're facing. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense, you know, and they're hearing the same rhetoric about fatness equals, you know, bad health. And they don't want that for their child. Um, They also all had 
like most people in the world, not the best uh, eating like relationship with food mm-hmm. and had some disordered eating mm-hmm. uh, that was happening. And I was being taught that as well because that's what I was around. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, different families that I was going to, you know, because you have split families, had different relationships with food as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it can get a little complicated when it's already – food is already a big thing for you where you're, you know, dieting or people around you are dieting. It's, I think that maybe sometimes people who haven't had these experiences with dieting culture and with their body not being right and not being um, thin enough and small enough, they don't understand how complicated food is, I think. And they're like, well, you know, you just, um, you know, it's important to learn uh, good nutrition skills and things like that. And I'm like, but that's not what I was learning. I was not learning good nutrition skills. I was learning good food, bad food. Um, I was also learning if I had any problem at home or school or whatever to be treated with food. That's what my family did. And that's what a lot of families do. If you're creating a system and an environment where you tell a child, you can't have this, you can't have this, you can't have this, or any human, really, they're going to want that thing. Mm -hmm. So it became contradictory messages. It became a lot of surveillance of my body, which if you're already someone who's been abused, you already have had surveillance of your body. And people having access to it and doing things to it that are against what you want. But you just want to be a good kid. You just want people to love you. You want to do the right thing. And so you follow along with what people tell you. They're adults. They should know better than you do. You're just a kid. What about dieting? When Do you remember the first diet that you went on? I believe my mom was going to Weight Watchers or some kind of dieting program It might have been something that was local in our community. And then she was teaching me that too. It's almost like weight loss buddies, uh, which is something that I just recently remembered uh, that happens sometimes. And um, my grandmother, I remember her being on a really stringent medical prescribed diet where she could only drink shakes and eat jello and drink water and maybe coffee and tea. And that was the only thing she could eat. And I was horrified by it. And there was also conversations. I think I was maybe in fifth grade or sixth grade when this was happening. And my, I remember my mom talking about how they were going to talk to my doctor about having me do that as well. And I was not a fat kid. (laughs) Like even scary. Yeah, it was, I, and luckily I don't know what happened. Um, that, that, that did not take place. Um, they did, There was also talk of sending me to like this bougie fat camp in La Jolla, California. Oh my gosh, I totally, I totally know that camp. You know what? Okay. So I watched the video. Mm -hmm. My mom was in conversation with this woman and I think that they couldn't get the money together to send me. I think Mm. that that's what happened. And I'm so thankful that I didn't go, but it was really touted to me as, you know, this will help you learn skills. You will, um not be, a, you know, this will help us so they won't be a fat person later on in life. You'll be with other, you know, kids who are overweight and struggling with food and all of this stuff. And I was just kind of like, I don't want to leave and go somewhere else. Um, yeah. But then there's also that caveat, right? There's always that carrot of like, your life's going to be better and everything's going to be solved. And uh, yeah, it just... But it sounds like in your childhood, you didn't really have a... Con- I mean, maybe I'm not hearing this right, mm-hmm. but a connection. You didn't f- actually feel fat. I did. You did? I absolutely okay. felt fat. Okay. I was absolutely paranoid about being fat okay. and being too fat and being too big. Um, and I think that that came on probably around third grade, so nine years mm-hmm. old. Bless my heart. I love my mother. and But she said some really hurtful things like, you know, you probably didn't get that role in the play because of your weight. Mm-hmm. You probably, you know, aren't going to get a, you know, a boyfriend or whatever because of your weight. Like it was always like, you know, you, you're, you have such a pretty face, you know, typical stuff that I think people don't realize how insidiously insulting and toxic that is mm-hmm. and how that plants some really horrible seeds in your head about how you don't have worth. Um, And, you know, I was thinking about recently that idea of you, like, I can't have my dreams come true. I can't kind of move um, in my life because I'm still in the before picture. I haven't figured out the secret to be in the after picture. Mm. 
I haven't figured out the secret of being thin. And therefore, I think that has in some way stunted my life, to be really honest. And it enrages me to know that that whole framework probably came from some dudes in like New York City in an ad agency trying to come up with how to market diets. Like, I'm just like, that has become a framework of my brain that I have fought against well, I, I think I haven't been aware of it for most of my life, but now I'm fighting against it and have been for many years. And it's just somebody somewhere with a marketing scheme. Wants to make and, money. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were reminding me too of when I interviewed Virgie Tovar and she talked about the, in this same type time period, she's mm-hmm. kind of the same age as us, the before and after of the movies that were going on at that time mm-hmm. like you for the summer you go home and you get transformed and you come back in the fall yes. and you're like this new hot girl yes. in school on campus it's yeah I went to Jenny similar... Craig I went through Jenny Craig um I think it was like four or five months before my senior year of high school during mm-hmm. that summer and so I had in some way a little bit of that transformational myth, ex- kind of a, a myth experience but it didn't I mean it didn't last because it's yeah. a diet so right um I f- I think that one thing that I is really important to talk about and acknowledge is that I was not a successful dieter I quote I'm using quote marks cheated a lot Um, because I couldn't stick to the diet that they wanted me on. And I felt really, really guilty about it. And, you know, I also knew that my parents were, especially with Jenny Craig and and some of the other things that we were doing, um, they're working class. They're paying a lot of money for this. And I wasn't successful. And it was terrible to go in and be weighed every week and be measured every week and to, you know, feel so incredibly guilty that they were wasting their money. I knew that they were wasting their money. And I remember uh, after I did Jenny Craig, I did lose weight on Jenny Craig and I gained it all back through my senior year. And I remember feeling so incredibly guilty because it didn't work and they wasted their money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one day, my dad and I were watching TV and a Jenny Craig commercial came on and I just immediately felt that hot burn of shame. And I, I think I said something to him about, I'm sorry that I've gained weight back. And I remember him saying, well, I mean, that's just the way things go. I'm not mad at you because of that. Good job. Um, <laughs> you know, and, That could have gone a lot worse. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think my mom would have had a different response, but he has always been uh, an amazing, beautiful, loving person. And so, I mean, he may have thought something different. I don't know, but that's what he said to me. And I think that that was super helpful. But oh, that burning shame and feeling like a failure and feeling like you don't have enough willpower. All of those, if you take, and those are just a couple of experiences I've said and talked about, if you take all of the experiences and you put them throughout your life, it starts to create this huge narrative that you have no worth, that you are this kind of like piece of shit and um, you are never are going to amount to anything. You're a failure. You're always going to be stuck in that before picture. So that must have continued through your young adult life. Yeah, it continued. Um, Is there a dieting. moment of the bottom of that for you that then it shifted and when I graduated from high school, I decided that I wasn't going to do any of that anymore. I wasn't going to restrict my eating. I wasn't going to do anything I, <laughs> I didn't want to do. And that's what I did. And Where do you feel like that came from? Uh, I think that I didn't want to be under control anymore. Your, your, your rebel came out. Uh, yeah, I have a strong, yeah, rebel okay. inside of me. Absolutely. And so... Um, so I didn't, but, but throughout my life in my twenties and my thirties, I still had moments where I would try dieting when I, I think it was in 2008, I considered weight loss surgery very seriously. I think I would have had it had I, my insurance, my, my insurance at the time didn't cover it. Um, because I just felt like I cannot continue to live in this body. I can't continue to live in this life. I can, I have no answers. Dieting doesn't work. Exercise doesn't work. Every time I try to diet, I maybe lose a little bit and then I gain like three times more. I, ha- I still dealt with disordered eating and an eating disorder. And um, 
it just seemed absolutely impossible. And that seemed like a possible solution. And then after that, I, it's, well, for me, it's not a good solution. Um, And also I have a really bad relationship and negative relationship with food. And so even if you cut part of my stomach out, I'm still going to have issues with food, Mm -hmm. whether, and that could really, really hurt me. And I think maybe some friends had conversations with me about Mm -hmm. that. And I couldn't find any successful um, eating disorder treatment either. Can we talk a little bit about your eating disorder? Mm -hmm. So I have uh, binge eating Mm -hmm. issues and they, I, you know, I've definitely had disordered eating my, my whole entire Mm -hmm. life. And my story that I told you makes sense of why that was. So I had an experience of being sexually assaulted when I was 21. Mm -hmm. And I can literally remember the moment that I bought like a big box of Whitman's chocolates and like ate all of the chocolates. Mm -hmm. And I remember that that I had this moment of looking at the box of chocolates and thinking, and they, you know, I'd eaten all of them and thinking, um, this is like another level. Like I've never done this before. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, there's no, it was kind of almost this moment of, of like, there's no going back now. I don't know. It's kind of a weird feeling. It's a weird memory, but I just remember being like, okay, you've now taken it to another level. Mm -hmm. And then that was just after that. What's your, what's your connection to, Mm -hmm. to from the sexual assault to that? Like, why would I deal with it that way? I'm, I mean, I, I guess I'm asking, did it feel protective? Did it feel nourishing? What was the, the thing behind it for you that you connect it to the sexual assault? Is that an okay question? Yeah. I don't know that I can give you a super clear um, answer for that because I think it's complicated. Right. I think my eating disorder, and I'm assuming this is this way for everyone else who has an eating disorder, um, is that it's complicated. It forms over a lifetime and it, it feeds or it helps with different mechanisms. So for me, the binge eating is about control. I can eat whatever I want, when I want, however much I want, F you, to everyone else in my life who's told me that I need mm-hmm. to diet or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think it can sometimes be about comfort. Sometimes mm-hmm. it can be about helping me disassociate from whatever feelings are happening mm-hmm. in my body or in my, my mind. Um, and so like, a, I guess a trauma response. And mm-hmm. so I think that is the biggest thing that makes sense to me is a trauma response. Mm-hmm. And, um, people have these theories too, that like, uh, you know, some people have binge eating issues and they gain weight after they've been assaulted cause they don't want people to find them attractive. Right. I don't know how much I think that that's true in my story in particular. It may be true for other people. I think that that's a slippery slope yeah Um, you gotta be careful with that one yeah I think it's a slippery slope and like we had said earlier um before we had started taping but being careful about um what we're attributing eating disorders to yeah and so that's so it's not eating disorders isn't really something I talk a whole lot about I And it depends on who I'm talking to about it. Like, I feel comfortable talking to you and things like that. There's certain, like, I wouldn't talk to, like, a group of doctors about it at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I haven't processed it enough and healed from it enough Mm -hmm. to be able to talk about it with a a group of people like that. We're always trying to find, again, that magic bullet of why people are fat or trying to prevent people from being fat. And I don't think that that exists because our lives are so complicated. And so... I think that that's also something that's prevented me from really talking a lot about my eating disorder in the context of being a fat activist is because I don't want that to happen. I don't want people to sort of just um, reduce my whole experience and story into this. Oh, that's why. Right. You know, there was a lot. That was the worry behind hunger. Roxy and Gay's book. Yeah. The big criticism of it for sure. Mm -hmm. But also people should be allowed to tell their own story. And there, I think that having those critical dialogues, like it doesn't necessarily mean that Roxanne needs to have those conversations because that's, you know, her own story. But like those of us who are reading those stories of having that critical dialogue. um, And, but that could be, I mean, I heard her be interviewed on, um, I can't remember the daily show. I think mm-hmm, it was, mm-hmm. and I was super excited. And also some of the conversation, I was like, Oh, oh cause it was sort of right. making those connections between those, but that's, um, her right to do that is her yeah. story. I just, I think it's important to remember that that's one particular story. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about your struggle to find 
recovery programs for your binge mm-hmm. eating disorder? Was that something you mentioned? So when that time I was talking about in like maybe 2000. 2000- nine 2010 where I'd considered weight loss surgery I had gone to group therapy for um I think it was mostly fat women who had had um weight loss surgery and were struggling with losing weight and dealing with your new life basically and then people who were considering and I was of course one of those people considering and then we had one-on-ones with a therapist and I was really asking her questions in our one-on-ones about you know, what was happening in my brain with my behavior? Like, why am I doing this? Like, why is my brain doing this? And she didn't really seem to have uh, good answers for me that made sense. She more was interested in talking about like weight loss surgery and how that was going to make things better. And I was really struggling with cutting out my guts or part of them isn't really going to help my mind. Like I'm, I'm having a hard time making that connection between those two things. That's so lucky that you had that. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. I just like, I don't, and it felt like a miracle, kind of a miracle fix. And, and I know that that doesn't work. Right. I mean, you really want the miracle, you know, fix, but it, it's never happened in my life. And so I stopped going because I felt like it wasn't what I needed at the time. Mm-hmm. And then I, went back to not telling anybody anything. And then I think it was during graduate school. So probably 2012, 2013, I was friends with someone and she just had this way about her that I told her my deepest, darkest secrets. And, and I talked about my eating disorder with her and I never talked to anybody except for that therapist about it. And, um, this woman was so, she was so supportive and kind. And I remember telling her she was the first person I could really tell how, like how much fast food I was eating. Cause I would, you know, would never, and I'm good at, you know, keeping things secret and covering up my tracks and her saying, Oh yeah, this one time I went through and da da da. And she kind of normalized it Mm, for me in a way mm -hmm. that was very validating and safe for me to be able to talk to her. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to have multiple conversations with her over a period of time. And she was like, you know, I mean, there are definitely people, you know, who can help you with that. And I started, I was definitely having a lot of problems mental health wise in graduate school. So I got some therapy and, um, I, the therapist I got was really amazing. After I think a year and a half, she moved to, um, the East coast. So I got another doc or another therapist that I currently have. And we do EMDR, which mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. eye movement, desensitizing, reprocessing therapy. And that has been life saving for me. It's so successful. Yes. So I just had my first EMDR this last year I started. Mm -hmm. It's intense. It's very intense. (laughs) I I don't know that it works for everyone, but if it works for you, I mean, it has been, right. There's no amount of talk therapy. Mm -hmm. I think that I could do to get where I'm at right now. And the interesting thing is it's, it seems woo woo a little bit, Mm -hmm. but um, they use it with PTSD vets and it's so well researched mm-hmm. and it's, it's so successful in the research, which is mm-hmm. really interesting. Yes. So let's talk about how all of this shifted to you becoming a fat activist and then a little bit more about the work mm-hmm. you do now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So I did some fat activist in the early, fat activism, in the early two thousands here in Portland with my friend Chelsea And we did some workshops and presentations. And I, one of the reasons why I stopped doing it is because I felt incredibly guilty because I had this huge secret of having this intense eating disorder. And what if people found out and they think that I was a fake? Um, And I didn't really have a good understanding of what fat activism was at the time. And then I'm, I'm interested in a fake to who? To everybody I was talking to because you're like you know be who you are in your body yes and I was absolutely 150% struggling with that right and um was not in the mindset that every not everybody but many people are struggling and it's okay to struggle as you're doing this work um I didn't have that mindset at all I had the mindset of um you gotta fully own it yeah, or you have to be really healed from it, you know, all those, or 
because I remember um, some of the people would be like, well, I'm fat, but I don't really have issues with food or I, you know, because there's a lot of fat people who don't have issues with food or they don't have eating disorders. Mm -hmm. Like it's just their body's fat. Right. And so that's what I was what I was around a lot. And I was like, I am a huge fake because I do have an eating disorder. And, you know, I think my size, which, you know, I people can't see me, but I'm not a small fat person. Like I'm, I consider myself super fat. I, not all of my fatness or my size has to do with binge eating, but a little bit of it does, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, disordered eating and it's sort of like, it's a gigantic monster following me around my whole life. But once I say it out loud, it seems like it shrinks mm-hmm. to something smaller. Mm-hmm. And, um, I always use the analogy of, it feels like, um, you're running and you're about to slam against a brick wall. But then you get to the wall and it's paper and you're just like, okay, I made it through the wall. <laughs> yes, exa- that is the best analogy. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Because it is, it is very much, you're like, oh, okay. okay you're like, I'm that is here. the worst thing in the world. I can't, I can't run it. I can't, I'm going to hit that. I'm going to die. Yes. I'm going to yeah. smash my face. And then you're like, oh, wait, I- I'm through it. I- I'm alive. Mm-hmm. I got some bruises, but I'm okay. Yeah, Anyways, right. Yeah. Like I totally lived through it. Yeah. I- okay. I also identify as a queer person. I've been out since I was like 21. Uh, But during that time, interestingly enough, when I was like having those issues with like, you know, should I get weight loss surgery and all that? At that time, I wasn't really, I wouldn't say I was in the closet, but I wasn't participating in queer community Mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So when I went into graduate school, I met, you know, some friends and that was the same time I was talking to this other person about like starting to talk about the eating disorder and all of that. And they were in queer community and they were like, Hey, there's this really cool queer fat activist, um, conference called no lose and you should totally go to it. And so I went and it was an amazing experience. And I met a lot of people who I'm still friends with and it was life-saving to be in that environment with other fat people who were like, yeah, this is like, we're fat and we're fabulous. And it were unapologetic. So. so tell us about the Body Sovereignty Project. Yes. So it's a healing project that is a collaboration between myself and my ancestors. I keep kind of talking about, mentioned graduate school several times, but it was a really um, difficult and stressful experience for me. And I was um, basically, I don't know, I guess I had like a nervous breakdown kind of mm-hmm. while I was there. And it was a very toxic environment, which was part of it. And I got really triggered the summer after that. After graduate school, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't live anymore. I can't figure out how to be in my body, how to respect who I am, how to heal the deep, deep wounds I have. And, um, you know, I'm taking medication. I'm going to therapy, you know, once a week. I'm working so incredibly hard, but I still hate myself. Mm -hmm. And I still feel like everyone hates me. And I had, you know, been diagnosed with complex PTSD at that time. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. So I I made a plan that I was going to take my life. And um, I remember laying in my bed uh, with my favorite dress on eating Cheetos. And um, my ancestors were like, because I have talked to them and it's part of my spiritual practice. And they were like, you know, Miha, you um, don't have to make that decision. Um, And I was like, well... Like, let me know what I should do because I feel like I've tried everything. I'm I'm a smart person and I can't think my way out of this. I've tried therapy, meds, everything. And they were like, well, you know, you're an artist and you're artistic and creative. You can build a ladder. Because I felt like I was in like a hole. And they were like, you can build a ladder to get yourself out. You can decorate that hole, <laughs> you know, to be beautiful. You can make a tunnel, like whatever. So this conversation ensued and basically we came to the point where I told them that I would continue to live if they would be my collaborators in my life. Mm-hmm. And, um, just yeah, when I would hit up, like I was basically like at a wall, I didn't know how to get the, the next level of healing that I needed. Mm-hmm. And, um, I was like, you know, I'm at a wall and I can't figure it out. And so could you give me a story or a song or a conversation or, or a vision or something to help me? And so they gave me this body sovereignty project and they were like, you're artistic, you're strong, you're a warrior and you, um, need to, um, use your culture as healing. Um, and you have to use culture. And so I, after that helped with some, um, 
culturally specific curriculum for my community, uh, Canoe Journey. And one of the 10 rules of Canoe is a hungry person has no charity. And it's this idea of when you're on Canoe Journey. Um, what is Canoe Journey? <laughs> so it's uh, so the people in the Northwest Coastal Tribes are canoe people. Um, mm-hmm. And traditionally, they're, you know, people would walk on land, but mostly people got around mm-hmm. on the waterways or the highways. And so people here have a, a really strong connection to canoe and canoe culture. But because of colonization, a lot of the tribal people here have stopped being in their canoe and the canoe culture. So in the, I think it was in the 90s, um, they decided to bring back some of those traditions and have canoe journeys. So um, a tribe in the Northwest, um, or it could be Oregon, Washington, Canada, will host canoe journey. And then any canoe families that want to, they will literally get in their you know canoes, their traditional canoes, and um, paddle up to wherever the host is at. And sometimes that can be a week. Sometimes it's three weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, And they paddle every day, all day long until they get there. And they have protocol and ceremonies. And um, it's just a really beautiful experience. The idea was if you're on canoe journey and someone gives you food, even if you're not hungry, you should eat it or take it to eat it later because you don't know when you're going to be able to eat again. And that when you're hungry, all you have to give is anger. And I thought about how true that was. And I expanded that idea to self-care and to taking care of yourself. And that if we don't take care of ourselves, then it's hard for us to give to others. Mm -hmm. And that was was exactly what I needed to hear in that moment. Mm -hmm. So I thought of ways that I could take care of myself. And, um, the, the body, my body sovereignty project is three things. It's my relationship with food being in my body through movement and then healing from sexual trauma, Mm. those three things. And it has to be verb. It has to be movement and action. It can't just be about me thinking about things. I actually need to go out and do things. Mm. So is your body sovereignty project just about you? Yes. Okay. I mean, I think it's also about my connection to people in the world and my relationship with my ancestors. you're not helping other people through the same process. This no. is just your journey. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I, part of that process too, my ancestors were like, you're going through this process, but we want you to also tell people about it sure. as you're going through it. Yeah. And it's a project, so I'm never going to be done with it, right? Because right. we know right. healing takes a lifetime. It's kind of hard to describe, but it's it's a sense of ancestor as in all of the people that came before you. Mm-hmm. Like all of them are here to love you and guide you. Um, and it's me learning how to be in my heart enough to hear them. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like I hear them in my heart. And, and to be, I imagine also... Uh, to be quiet enough to hear them. Mm-hmm. And it really just sounds like me. It sounds like my own voice. The tenor is a little bit different. And and I remember, you know, sometimes when I talk about this to people who um, maybe are in professional capacities like doctors or psychologists or whatever, people who um, they may, I think some people get uncomfortable about the spiritual part of my healing journey. And I, that's fine. I don't really care um, <laughs> if they're uncomfortable or not, but because it's true. But I, you know, I'm like, at the end of the day, if that is just me and not my ancestors, it's just part of me, then that's fine because it helps, right? It doesn't, mm-hmm. I, that's what I believe it to be. Mm-hmm. But other people don't need to, like, I don't need them to believe that right. it's true right? for me. So, Do you feel like that's been with you your whole life? Yeah. I think my ancestors have been with me my whole life. Mm-hmm. And I think that I've definitely, you know, I've definitely been a spiritual person, even as a child was mm-hmm. quite spiritual um, and connected. And about, I think it's been about 15 or 16 years ago, uh, I became um, more involved in Portland's urban Indian community and since then have really um, had experiences. I've been very I'm grateful to have experiences in different kinds of ceremonies and serving the community and working at the Native American Youth and Family Center in several different capacities um, and really learning traditions that way. I know some traditions as Cheyenne, um, and I'm also a typical urban Indian where it's kind of you learn different things from different people. I've had, um, you know, uh, an uncle who is um, who was Lakota. He's since crossed over and he taught me a lot of different things. And when you're around that and around the ceremonies, I think that if you're open to it, you can connect with those ancestors and you can connect to that knowledge that's already in our DNA. Mm -hmm. Just like the trauma is also passed down, like Mm -hmm. that knowledge is also passed down as well. 
And I think it's, like I said, I think it's always been there. And I had an experience where a friend of mine was singing a song, a, a Grandmother Moon song. And I was like, I know that song. Like, I remember like singing that in my childhood and I don't remember who taught me that song. And where, where did you, what is that song? And, um, my friend said, you know, it's a grandmother moon song. And I was like, you know, where did I, I don't know where I learned that. I mean, maybe somebody sang it at some point and it just kind of caught on or maybe my ancestors sang it to me or I don't really know, but I think, um, you know, there are definitely, I have had several experiences where, you know, I remember a grandparent crossed over and I cut all my hair off and then I, came to find out later that that's part of grieving process for a lot of native people is mm -hmm. to cut your hair when, when somebody has crossed over. So it's in your DNA. Yeah. 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 Do you want to talk a little bit more about your consulting sure. work and then, and maybe even just kind of some of the work you do around trauma? Yeah. Okay. So I have a new consulting business, Floosh Cum Tux Tum Tum Consulting, which means a great awakening of the heart and spirit in Chinook Wawa. It's come through me as healing as a great awakening of my heart and spirit. And I'm hoping to also help other people find a great awakening within their hearts and spirits in a way that makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily need to look for, like mine. And so a lot of that work has been in um, sharing my story. And sharing my story is a lot about talking about equity of all kinds. So racial equity, um, gender and sexual um, orientation, like kind of that kind of equity, medical equity, talking about weight stigma and healing and how do we, you know, talking about colonization and talking about oppression um, and doing social justice type of work. And so orienting all of that work through a great awakening of the heart and spirit. What do you feel like are still the biggest weeds you pull from the patch that keep coming up to go back to that metaphor you brought up? I think I fight a lot with the constant threat of dying early because I'm fat, mm -hmm. of having serious medical issues because I'm fat, like that stress and strain, uh, that very much is something I'm constantly fighting against that mindset mm -hmm. of like, I'm running away from death or I, I and I think the other time type thing is a stereotype threat. I don't want to be like that stereotypical, like fat person. I don't want them to be proven right about right. me. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that's like a constant thing that is that motivates my thoughts and sometimes my behavior and mm -hmm. sometimes my reaction to things as well. Yeah. And so I have to yeah. really stop sometimes and be like, where is that coming from? Is that coming from healthism? Is that coming from the threat of this quote obesity epidemic and all of that kind of rhetoric? What haven't we talked about that we want to talk about or did you want to talk about? like talking to doctors at all and like medical stuff. Yeah. Let's, let's share that. Yeah. So through this body sovereignty project and this healing, I, I think one of the first areas I really started advocating for myself was with doctors and with uh, medical systems because it's so oppressive and so stigmatizing for me. I don't want to speak for other people, although I think a lot of people feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking for myself, um, have had a lot of very hurtful experiences and have had some negative health um, impacts because of negligence um, from doctors. So I had been um, stressed and I had uh, gotten a really bad infection uh, while I was in graduate school and had to have some wound care because I'd have some surgeries on my leg. It was the first time I went in and I had been to their office, I think three days previous, and the, the nurse wanted me to, to get my weight. And I was like, you literally weighed me three, three days ago. Mm -hmm. And weight, weighing for me is full of a lot of trauma and triggers. And sure. I didn't want to do it. And I just said to her, no, I'm not going to do it. And she's like, well, you know, we really need to get your weight. And I was like, you just weighed me three days ago. So no. Well, I mean, it's really important. And I said, I told you no. And if you continue to harass me about this, I'm going to leave this appointment and I'm going to file a complaint against you. So you can decide what you want to do next and she stopped talking and took me back to the room but that was the first time that I really stood up for myself mm -hmm. and said no I'm not doing this anymore I decided that I needed to be very clear with medical providers about what my boundaries were what my expectations for care were mm -hmm. and what my 
health and wellness goals were and I was going to expand into health and wellness and then wanting to work collaboratively with a provider. Mm -hmm. So I created a four page document Mm. uh, that went over my identity. So I identify as queer, you know, fat, blah, 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 like what I wanted to be called. And then I have the most, most of it is about my expectations that you will do these things to help my health and wellness goals. So it's things like Weight loss, weight loss surgery, and dieting will never be a part of my health and wellness um, conversation, and, conversation yeah. and, and process. So don't bring that up to me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the other things I think that was really important was this is my, I'm on a, a journey of healing. And you as a medical provider are one star in a constellation of people that are helping me. Mm-hmm. You're an important part, but you are not the only part. Mm-hmm. So. How have you been received with that? It's been great. I've not oh, had any awesome. problems. Is that document something you'd be willing yes. to share? Mm-hmm. I'll add it in the show notes. Yeah, That'd we can great. totally... It's it's kind of a template, and I have my own wording great. on there, but yeah. people can totally add, take out, whatever. There's kind of a power, power dynamic there that's mm-hmm. really important. That they, even if they just, you know, kind of briefly look through it it's worded very kind of sternly in a way because I want to get their attention yeah and um and I want the the again I want people to know that if you take any like the only thing you take away from this this part of the conversation is that nobody has the right to do anything to your body that you don't want to do and nobody has the right to have a conversation with you that you actually don't want to have so if you don't want to be weighed you don't need to be weighed now there may be if they're going to do surgery and there's you know um anesthesia involved in that they're probably going to need your current weight Mm -hmm. to be able to do calculations but for the most part you can also request them not to tell you exactly that's such great advice i can't wait to read that document that sounds really powerful it's awesome i've had great great experience with it so good good it's kind of like everyone you date you're probably not going to marry right every doctor you meet I mean, especially if they're a primary care practitioner, may not be a good fit for you. Yeah, just same like, with therapists. Exactly, right? Sometimes yeah. you have to do, it sucks, but sometimes you have to do a little yeah, bit I of... have a dating pool of therapists. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much for this. This has been amazing, wonderful to get to know you. Yeah, thank you yeah. for the great conversation. Yeah. I love your podcast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining me today for Everybody Podcast please take a moment and rate us on whatever place you're listening to us. Those ratings really help bring more people to the podcast. I'm still working on my Weight Watchers episode, so if you have a story, good or bad, please do get in touch. Until next time, everybody.